Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is an award-winning author. Her first five books are novels with a distinct focus on Jewish characters, philosophies, and sensibilities. But her sixth and most recent book is alarmingly entitled People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present. It's a fascinating collection of essays exploring modern-day anti-Semitism. This thought-provoking and disturbing book challenges us to confront the bitter realities underlying the public fascination with the massacre of Jews throughout history, juxtaposed against a societal backdrop that has great interest in Jewish deaths, but very little respect for Jewish lives. She's the recipient of two National Jewish Book Awards and the Reform Judaism Fiction Prize. Her books have been selected as New York Times Notable Books, Book Lists 25 Best Books of the Decade, and the San Francisco Chronicle's Best Books of the Year. She's been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, Smithsonian Magazine, and the Jewish Review of Books. She received her doctorate in comparative literature from Harvard and has taught at the Yeshiva University and was a visiting professor in Jewish studies at Harvard. It's my great pleasure to welcome Dara Horn to our show. Dara, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Dara, I have to tell you as a Jewish man that your book challenged almost all of my beliefs about how we relate to our history and how we've been perceived in the non-Jewish world. You rightly pointed out that for most people, Jews are known as the people who have been historically targeted for annihilation. And you say that there's something deeply perverse about being known primarily for that attribute. What made you decide to write the book? Well, well, I just want to say thanks so much for having me here and, and for diving right into this you know, topic. Like you said, the, t- the title is, you know, is, if you think the title is disturbing, you'll probably even be more disturbed by what's inside the book. I, I started thinking about this in 2018 when Smithsonian Magazine asked me to write an essay about Anne Frank. And when that happened, I got that request and I was just filled with a sense of dread because I thought, wow, I really don't want to write an essay about Anne Frank. And, you know, I, the logical thing to do would be to turn the assignment down, but I'm a writer, I'm not a logical person. So I was, you know, thinking, you know, why don't I want to write about this? Because something that I've learned in my 20 years of, of writing, publishing novels, writing nonfiction, is that the uncomfortable moments are often where the story is. And so that's like when you find that moment that you want to avoid is maybe where you should dive deeper. So I was thinking about this, why and trying to figure out like, why did I, was I not interested in writing about Anne Frank? And then I remembered a news item that I had come across a few months earlier. So again, this is in 2018 about something that had happened at the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam. So Anne Frank, of course, was this uh, teenage girl who kept a diary. She was hiding um, in a, uh, some hidden rooms in an office building with her family and several other people during the Nazi persecution. They were captured and then you know, taken to Auschwitz where she was killed. Her diary was discovered after her death. And th- these rooms where her family and these other people were hiding is now like this blockbuster museum where, I mean, easily two million visitors a year. There was a young Jewish employee at this museum in 2018 And his employers would not allow him to wear his yarmulke to work, right? This is the small um, little skull cap that's worn by observant Jewish men. They would not allow him to wear his yarmulke to work. They made him hide it under a baseball cap. And he appealed this decision to the board of the museum. And they deliberated for four months. And then they relented and they let him wear his yarmulke to work. And I had read this news story and I thought, you know, four months is a really long time for the and Frank House to ponder whether or not it was a good idea to force a Jew into hiding. And I just thought, you know, this is like a PR mishap, but it's not really a mistake. And the, so I did write that piece for Smithsonian and it's actually, it's now the first chapter of this book. And the first line of that piece is, people love dead Jews, living Jews, not so much. And it's sort of about this requirement that Jews erase some aspects of their identity in order to be part of a public conversation. So that piece came out in Smithsonian Magazine in the fall of 2018. Within a few days of that, of that being published, there was the Tree of Life Synagogue massacre in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here in the United States, where you know, some of, there was a, a mass shooting at a synagogue. Within hours of that attack, the New York Times called me and asked me to write an op-ed about this. 
Uh, and then, you know, a few months later, there's another synagogue shooting. New York Times calls me again. As I put it in the piece, you know, I, I somehow became the New York Times' go-to person for the emerging literary genre of synagogue shooting op-eds, not a job I applied for. And I just started thinking about this. And I realized that, you know, look, I've, I've as you mentioned, I have a doctorate in, in Yiddish and Hebrew literature. I've published five novels that are all about Jewish life and history and culture. And then I just started realizing, you know, why do all of my editors at mainstream magazines and newspapers only want me to write about dead Jews? And that is where the point that I came to that you mentioned at the beginning, that there is something perverse about this sort of fascination with Jewish deaths that does not allow for any kind of expression of Jewish life in the present. And that's why I wrote this book. You mentioned in the Anne Frank chapter that it's very disturbing that other than a few books by Eli Wiesel and Primo Levi, none of the books written by people who actually survived the Holocaust received anywhere near the acclaim that Anne Frank's book did. Why is that disturbing to you? Well, not even just that she's, you know, that it's people who survived or didn't survive, but it's disturbing to me because what you find is that the people whose accounts from the Holocaust, whether as survivor, sur survivors or testimony is like the most popular, are people who are writing in a Western language and who are sort of presenting this as a way of, of sort of where in a way that erases a lot of Jewish identity. So the example of Anne Frank is, is really, really expresses this because this is someone who's writing in Dutch living a sort of a, you know, she was not religious, not writing in the Jewish language, you know, 85% of the people murdered in the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers. I would point your viewers, especially in Canada, to uh, a, um, a Canadian Jewish writer who uh, passed away about 10 years ago, Chava Rosenfarb, who was a survivor of the Lodz ghetto, um, and then after the war lived her life in, um, in Canada. But when you read her books and her poetry, and she's writing in Yiddish, and then you know she, she and also her, her daughter translated her, her materials into English, so a lot of her work is available in English, you see this vibrant Jewish life. In taking place in a Jewish language where, you know, you have this like vast Jewish, you know, thousand year old Jewish civilization in Europe with all of this sort of like internal developments. And you have like a religious tradition, you have a secular tradition, you have literature, you have theater, you have art, you have all this like this entirely vibrant world. That's what was destroyed in the Holocaust. Right. I mean, today there are still plenty of people who are, you know, living a Western language, living in these Western countries, participating in, you know, like Dutch culture didn't die in the Holocaust, but, you know, Yiddish speaking European culture did. And that's what we like aren't interested in. To me, I used to always ask people at my public talks about my novels, how many people here can name four concentration camps? Yeah, that's something a lot of educated people can do. But then I would ask those same people, how many of those same people can name four Yiddish writers? As I mentioned, 85% of the people killed in the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers. This is a famously literary culture. Why do we care so much about how these people died when we have zero interest in how these people lived? And I think that that's really what reveals that I feel that the memory of the Holocaust is being used to like teach people like a nice lesson about memory, about like, you know, humanity's limits and redemption. It's like, it's a metaphor, but like, we are not at all interested in the people who are actually murdered. And I find that what's amazing to me is you see that same sentiment repeated again and again in, in situations that far are far removed from, from Holocaust memory. And we can talk about some of those as well. Now, you take issue with the fact that some of the most popular novels about the Holocaust, books like The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, The Tattooist of Auschwitz, Sarah's Key, The Book Thief, you rightly point out, Dara, that these books don't reflect the realities of the Holocaust for the vast majority of Jewish victims, but they're the popular books. Why? People want to turn this into a story that makes them feel good about themselves. You know, it's nice to read about a romance at Auschwitz, you know, like, wow, that's beautiful. I mean, or another one is the emphasis on non-Jewish rescuers. We have a lot of stories about like, you know, wonderful, noble non-Jewish rescuers. There weren't a whole lot of non-Jewish rescuers. Should the people who did do that get attention? Sure. It was extremely atypical. I mean, surviving the Holocaust was extremely atypical, right? I mean, the stories of Holocaust rescue are statistically insignificant. So are stories of Holocaust survival. But like, 
nobody wants to hear about like the actual, you know, what actually happened, which was this like mass murder of and destruction of a civilization. Um, that's why I, in the book, I do compare um, some of those novels with this, like they have this feel good ethos where there's this desire that people have where they want, they want a story that makes them feel good about themselves. Um, to go back to the Anne Frank example, um, I think the most glaring example of this is from Anne Frank's diary, the most popular line in that diary, the one that's like on the book jacket on the wall of the museum is where she says, you know, I still believe in spite of everything that people are truly good at heart, right? Like we find that line inspiring by which of course we mean it flatters us, right? It makes us feel forgiven for lapses of our civilization that allow for piles of murdered girls, you know? And so like, you know, we turn this into this like, oh look, this murdered Jewish girl has offered us grace, right? But the reality is much simpler. You know, Anne Frank wrote that line about people being truly good at heart three weeks before she was arrested and deported to Auschwitz. And you know what? When she when that happened, she met people who weren't truly good at heart. Right. I mean, literally, she wrote this line about people being good at heart three weeks before she met people who weren't. And like, that's the story that nobody wants to tell. So and I see that um, I, I think it has there's a narrative arc that we expect in Western literature where we want this redemptive ending. And what I find really interesting is, and I talk about this in the book, is when you read literature in Jewish languages, like in Yiddish and Hebrew, there isn't that expectation of this redemptive arc. Instead, the narratives are much more structured around the ideas of endurance and resilience. You know, it's amazing. I, I have to tell you, Dara, that I actually loved all those books that I mentioned until I read your book. And you made me realize that it's not only artificial, it's actually offensive to write Holocaust fiction that's supposed to be uplifting when the subject matter is atrocity. Yes, correct. And I think that there is something that is, there's an, that that's, there's this expectation. And this is what I talked about, about um, Jews erasing themselves in order to participate in a public conversation. It's like, you cannot be angry about this. Um, I give the example in the book of Elie Wiesel, who you mentioned earlier, Elie Wiesel's book Night, which you know, is a book that you know, a lot of people read um, about his experiences in concentration camps. Um, you know, that book originally was published in Yiddish. And in Yiddish, the title of the book was And the World Was Silent. And it was tells the same story, but it is full of this anger at the nations of the world that allowed this genocide to happen. But what he did was just very interesting. He was when he was translating the book into French. And of course, it's the French, it's the French version of the book that then was translated into English and many other languages. It's not a translation, it's an adaptation. And he worked with uh, the French Catholic Nobel laureate, Francois Mauriac. And what he did in that translation, or really, as I said, adaptation, is he shifted the sort of the blame for the situation, if you will, from a political anger to a theological anger. So he turned this like, you know, instead of being where were the nations of the world, that book is like, where was God? Like, you know, because and, and it was in a sense, it was a very canny decision, because if you're writing this for, you know, a French audience in 1958, you know, for a reading public that was, you know, in many ways complicit in this massacre, right? Like those people don't want to read about, you know, how they're responsible, right? Better to blame God, right? We can all get behind that. You know what I mean? You know, and that's, you know, and that sort of is, um, I think the problem is, you know, that there, there's an anger that people are, are unwilling to accept, um, you know, and that's there's this requirement that one be polite and that one make other people feel comfortable. And that's what I'm pushing back against in this book. You wrote about a little known American journalist by the name of Varian Fry, who ran a rescue operation in Vichy, France, to save 2000 Jewish artists, writers, professors and great philosophers from the Nazis. You said there was an alarming lack of gratitude among the people that he saved. When you look at the gratitude expressed by the people rescued by Schindler and Raoul Wallenberg, why do you think the people saved by Vary and Fry were so ungrateful? Um, I think there's a, a, a few reasons for that. So I want to clarify. So Vary and Fry's um, rescue operation, it was not just like to rescue Jews, although many of the people who rescued were Jewish, many were not. It was really to rescue um, like these, it was like this A-list of intellectuals and artists and writers and thinkers um, that was compiled by a lot of American intellectuals and, and sort of cultural elite to rescue these you know, persecuted dissidents, basically, many of whom were Jewish, many of whom were not. Um, so, you know, he had these like A-list celebrities who then after the war would not give him the time of day. So uh, we're talking about, you know, Marc Chagall, who he like 
not only like got him a visa it was this wasn't just like here's your visa he was like smuggling these people over the Pyrenees mountains into spain i mean this was like an underground operation they were being arrested all the time they were being bugged by the trailed by the vichy police um i mean this is someone who really risked his life to save these people um you know, a few years after the war, he approaches Marc Chagall and asks him, you know, to donate um, a lithograph for a project he's doing to raise money for other refugees. Marc Chagall's like, nah, don't feel like it. No, thanks. Right. And this is and it happens again and again with many artists. Um, Andre Breton, who is not Jewish, but is you know, a, a major uh, French surrealist writer, um, you know, Marcel Duchamp, Max Ernst. Right. These are like, you know, major writers and artists of the time. They don't want to give him the time of day. And so, you know, as you mentioned, so like some of these people like Rollo Wallenberg or Oscar Schindler, like did maintain relationships with the people they rescued. Um, I think there's something different in his mission. First of all, I mean, he's rescuing a bunch of celebrities who, you know, maybe are divas and are not very nice people. That could be in some cases, but it's also something else. Um, gratitude in a lot of cases is what makes you hate someone because they have revealed to you that you couldn't do it yourself they've revealed your weakness. And so I think for a lot of people, especially the more sort of independent, successful people, um, you know, the more competent, successful and independent you are, the less willing you are to be grateful to someone else, because what that person has done is they've revealed what you couldn't do on your own. And so I think that that, I think, was made it very difficult for these, these rescued intellectuals to ever, I mean, oh, another one is Hannah Arendt, who spent her whole life writing about totalitarianism and, and, and you know, exactly these issues, never once acknowledged in any public word that she was rescued by this person. Even when she heard this person being publicly insulted, would not defend him. So very interesting idea. But what I think, what I really get into in the book, though, also is, you know, Varian Fry himself not only is ignored by all these celebrities that he saved, but also like, you know, lives a life of not just obscurity, but really suffering. Um, I mean, his life kind of fell apart after he came back from this trip to Europe. I mean, he, he like couldn't keep a job. I mean, he, you know, he had two heart attacks, died as a fa fairly young man, um, you know, and it's sort of like, you know, he never got any kind of recognition for what he did. And what I thought was sort of interesting is that, you know, he had been part of this operation where they're like, it was almost its own kind of eugenics operation where they're like, you know, all these American intellectuals being like, who in Europe do we want to save? And, you know, they made this like list of like, here are the people. And what they're really saying is here are the people our society values. Who do we value? We value, you know, people who are, you know, intellectuals. We value people who are, you know, uh, who are artists, economists, pol you know, political thinkers, artists, writers, musicians. Okay. That was not the gift that he had. And what I say in the book is the gift he had is not one that we value, which is moral clarity. Right. And what I said is like, you know, he's everybody who talks about him says he was like this oddball. And I said, you know, but the way he was an oddball, his oddness was not like the oddness of somebody like an artist like Marcel Duchamp. His oddness was the oddest oddness of somebody like the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel. You know, he had this kind of moral vision that, you know, struck other people as odd, right? I mean, he was trying to save these people when nobody else was interested. Um, I mean, he ended up, you know, it, at first he was supported by the United States Department of State, but the State Department ended up shutting down his mission and deciding like, no, we actually don't care about this. They, he, his passport expired and they refused to renew it and they shut down his mission and made him come back to the United States. So you really see this sort of, it, it reveals a lot about the values of, 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 of a society. Yes, absolutely. One of the most thought provoking chapters in your book for me was the one about Holocaust museums. You wrote that, and I'm quoting you here, perhaps presenting all these facts has the opposite effect from what we think. Perhaps we are giving people ideas about our standards, that isolated acts of killing Jews in synagogues or harassing Jews on college campuses are not so bad because they're not the Holocaust. Dara, that's actually a revolutionary concept, because I think it's fair to say that most Jews are happy to see so many Holocaust museums and memorials. Well, so I do think that, you know, in the past 30 years um, in the United States and certainly in Canada as well, um, you know, there's been this sort of, you know, there was this sort of burgeoning of building all these Holocaust museums and memorials and, and school curricula and things like that. And you know, the, there was, you know, and I remember when, I mean, certainly when the Holocaust Museum in Washington opened when I was a teenager, you know, there was this, you know, as grim as those museums were, there was like a kind of a, a almost like they were motivated by a kind of optimism because the thought was like, people would go to these museums and learn what the world had done to the Jews, learn where hatred can lead. And then they would 
stop hating Jews. Um, you know, it wasn't a ridiculous idea, but, you know, 25, 30 years later, I think we maybe can reevaluate it because, I mean, levels of anti-Semitic hate and incidents and things like that are much higher now than they were when these museums opened in the 1990s. So, um, you know, I am questioning that premise and also like diving into that premise, because as I said in the book, as you quoted, right, um, you know, you know, yes, like it was really important for people to learn about the Holocaust so that we don't repeat it. You know, OK, I know that, you know, I learned that in school, like many of us did. I hope all of us did. But what that has come to mean is that like anything that's short of the Holocaust, like is kind of no big deal. The bar is rather high. Um, and, you know, what that really has come to mean, it's like, you know, anything short of the Holocaust is not the Holocaust. Like I mentioned, you mentioned the examples of like, you know, harassing Jewish college students, college students is not the Holocaust. You know, trolling Jews on social media is not the Holocaust. You know, shooting up a synagogue. Oh, that's a lone wolf. It's not systemic. It's not the Holocaust. Like even as I mentioned later in that same passage, you know, um, how about, you know, driving entire Jewish communities out of entire countries and seizing all their assets, which is what happened in like, you know, almost the entire Islamic world in the mid 20th century. Also not the Holocaust. Like, I'm like, it's kind of impressive how many things are not the Holocaust. And this goes back to this premise that I mentioned earlier. People tell stories about dead Jews that make them feel better about themselves. This is really the, the, the reason, the secret of the success of all these Holocaust museums and memorials is People like to learn about that because, you know, we all look great compared to the Nazis, right? Like, I mean, you know, like that's, you know, that is like, you know, that's, that's, that's not a hard standard to meet. Like, you know, we all can go to the Holocaust Museum and be like, I'm better than that. Well, right? do, do you believe that Holocaust education plays any role in preventing anti-Semitism? I'm, I don't know. I will tell you, I don't know, because what you see now in the way that people harass Jews, you will see like, you know, like if somebody is like, you know, trolling Jews on social media by like Photoshopping them into a gas chamber, that person has heard of the Holocaust. It's not an education problem, right? There's something, and you know, I'm not saying that, what I would suggest though is that like, here's what I see as the problem. I'm not saying that people should never learn about the Holocaust. That's not what I'm arguing. But I was actually alarmed to hear, and this is not in the book, but recently, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, I'm a Harvard graduate, so I have a lot of very highly educated friends speaking to a non-Jewish friend of mine recently. And, you know, she was talking about something about, you know, going back to her family's ancestral town in Ireland or something. And she was like, you know, I never asked you, you know, where's, you know, where's, where's your ancestral country? And I was like, this is a complicated question for Jews because, you know, yeah, did my great great grandparents come from Poland? Yeah, that's nice. They were never citizens there. They were never respected there. And they were, you know, like, and it's, and I said, my family is not Holocaust survivors. My family left, you know, and not even Poland in, in, in the Russian Empire. My family left because of pogroms. And I was just explaining this to my highly educated Harvard graduate friend. And she was like, pogroms, what? I was like, well, I mean, there were civil war pogroms in, during the Russian Civil War from 1919 to 1921 when 50,000 Jews were massacred. And she was like, wait, what? And I was like, well, except that my family came earlier than that. They came during the 1905 pogroms when you know, Jews were massacred all over uh, you know, during the, the first Russian Revolution. She's like, wait, what? And then I was like, do you know about like you know, the Crusades <laughs> where like, you know, all of the Rhineland Jews were murdered? She's like, wait, what? And I was like, you do know that they killed all the Jews during the Black Death, right? And that's why there are all these Jewish genetic diseases because there was this population bottleneck. And she was like, well, what? And I was like, yeah, like, <laughs> it's really not about the Holocaust. And, you know, there's sort of like this shocking moment where you realize like, and and so that's and that's not even like the, the problem is like, you know, that's this history of persecution, okay? Which people don't, you know, because people think of the, and the Holocaust is taught as if it's like this moment outside of history that we're all like, oh, how could this possibly happen? It's like, the Yiddish word for Holocaust is Chorban, which is the same word that's used for the destruction of the temple and the, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans and then by the Babylonians. I mean, this is a long pattern. It goes back thousands of years. So, um, you know, so there's that kind of ignorance that I think is one problem that is, you know, the Holocaust, you know, being taught the way it is, is often taught as an isolated 
kind of thing outside of history, or it's taught in the context of like, well, then there's like, you know, Pol Pot in Cambodia. And it's like, well, yes. So like, you know, there's sort of two ways of looking at this, um, but you know, there's certainly nothing unique about this. And so that's the first piece. But the other problem that I have with this is that what's not being taught. And this is what the book opens with this, which is um, that there are many people in the world who have only encountered, as I say, dead Jews. Basically that for them, what they have been taught in their very well-intentioned education is that Jews are people who were murdered and we're supposed to learn something from them being murdered. And that's why it's like, it's kind of like a nice little lesson about humanity. So I wanna give the example of like sort of the school history or social studies textbook, right? What do you see about Jews in a school uh, history textbook for children or for teenagers? If it's, a, if it's a book that's got some ancient history in it, then you maybe have a paragraph about the Israelites, right? You know, who, you know, they don't mention that those are Jews, right? It's like, you know, they might as well be Phoenicians. You know, they're just one other ancient Near Eastern, whatever. That's like a paragraph at the beginning about, you know, people who are apparently very dead and we don't care about them anymore. Then there's a chapter at the end of the book about the Holocaust. Well, think about what would happen if you actually taught people about the role of the Jews in Western civilization. You know, what the astonishing thing about Jewish history is that Jewish history is this, Jewish culture is this counterculture that runs through the history of the West, right? And it sort of is at every moment, sort of, first of all, is the foundation of, of, of Western civilization in terms of Christianity and Islam. But second of all, is also a kind of a, a constant challenge to Western civilization that runs through all societies and contradicts so much of what we think we know about world history. Um, I'm gonna just finish this, this, my little rant about this by mentioning something that has happened to me with my children. Um, in the school district where we live, there's um, in sixth grade, which is for you know, 11 and 12 year olds, they do um, a, a curriculum about ancient history, ancient civilizations. And each of my children, when they get to this curriculum, gets very confused because the, each of them, when they've gotten to this age, has come home at some point during the school year and said, you know, in school, we're learning about all these great civilizations. We learn about ancient Egypt, we learn about ancient Greece, we learn about ancient Persia, ancient Rome, and, you know, ancient Babylonia. And they said, like, you know, we learn about all these amazing achievements. And then at home, we have, for each of these ancient civilizations, we have a holiday about how they tried to kill us. And then they're like, so I'm like, mom, I'm confused. Like, are these great civilizations or are they not? And the answer is yes. Like, yeah, ancient Egypt achieved great things and amazing engineering feats, feats, and they did it with slave labor, right? This is sort of like, I think if you in introduce Jewish history into Western history, it really upends and challenges a lot of what we think. And I think what brought in the conversation in a way that we're looking for today when we talk about how we want to talk, um, include more diversity in education. Yeah, that's really, that's a fascinating point. One of the most surprising things I learned from your book is that the story we've heard a thousand times about Jewish immigrants' names being anglicized and changed by the immigration officials at Ellis Island is a complete myth. The truth is that Jewish immigrants voluntarily changed their names to avoid anti-Semitism. First of all, how do you know that? Well, okay, so this is this is not, you know, a, a lot of people have approached me being like, you know, oh, how can you prove this? This is not like a state secret. You know, like when you go to the Ellis Island Museum, they announce it on public tours. They're like, a lot of people have this mythology about that, you know, there's some clerk who changed your family's name. It never happened. Nobody here ever wrote down anyone's name. Ellis Island, they got the names from people from Manifest, the ship Manifest from the shipping company. Those were compiled at the Port of Origin. At the Port of Origin, this wasn't happening either because there they were compiling it from state issued documents the same way we would today, like passports and things like that. Um, you know, and, you know, and also if they made errors on those, it's, they were very careful not to make errors because anybody who was imp um, improperly documented once they got to Ellis Island had to be shipped back to Europe at the company's expense. So like, you know, that kind of error is going to cost somebody their job. So nobody's doing that. So, but also, if, like I said, nobody at Ellis Island's writing down people's names. Even if that weren't true, which it is, we have tens of thousands of court records in New York City civil court of immigrants, of, it's not even immigrants, a lot of the time it's children's of, children of immigrants changing their own names. Um, and when you look through, so this is not my research, I wanna credit Kirsten for Megleff, the um, historian who wrote a book called A Rosenberg by Any Other Name about Jewish name changing in the United States. Um, and I'm sure there are similar patterns in Canadian, in, uh, Jewish immigration to Canada as well. Um, she tracks these court filings and she says like, 
Jewish sounding last names are like 90% of the names that are being changed. She's like, you look through these court records and it's just pages and pages of Cohen's. And to me, what I thought was fascinating about this mythology is, as you said, you're like, how do you know that's true? People really want to believe this story. Because whenever I've spoken about this publicly, like people get mad at me. You know, if I write about it, it's all over the comments. Oh, my great grandfather's the exception. My, he wouldn't lie. You know, um, you know when I, I get pilloried at public talks, when I bring this up. This legend is doing emotional work for people. And the emotional work it's doing is it is hiding American anti-Semitism. Because these people changed their names, not because they like wanted to cast off their Jewish identity, because a lot of these people, they continued living in Jewish neighborhoods. They still were members of synagogues. They say, well, it's not like they were pretending not to be Jews. They couldn't get a job, right? Like their kids were being bullied in school. Like, you know, they couldn't go to professional school. They couldn't rent an apartment, right? I mean, these were basic life things that were realities that were staring them in the face. And I think that they, those people kind of did their descendants a favor by creating this legend, right? Which, you know, has that legend has sort of led people like, you know, my age to believe that like, oh, American anti-Semitism never happened. And then that's why, of course, we're always surprised when that sort of thing comes up again. So these immigrants who changed their names because they wanted to avoid anti-Semitism, yes. they perpetuated the myth that their names were changed at Ellis Island so they could convey to their kids the impression that America was welcoming and not anti-Semitic. Yeah. And, and then the Ellis Island name change becomes just a humorous anecdote. Yes. And there's, and I think that you often see that in, in American Jewish culture and perhaps in Canadian Jewish culture as well, that the humor is kind of used as a mask to hide something that you don't want to talk about. Now, I got to tell you, Dara, this part of the interview is hard for me. The chapter of your book that really hit home for me is the one about the Merchant of Venice. I was the only Jew in my high school, and we had to study the Merchant of Venice in grade 10 English class. And the teacher went to great lengths to explain that the play is not anti-Semitic. But you wrote, and this has really been very healing for me, you wrote that we've all been gaslighted in a perverse historical mind trick, justifying the humiliation of the Jewish people. Now, given the recent proliferation of cancel culture, are you surprised that The Merchant of Venice is still being taught in school? I mean, you know, like, I want to be clear, like, I'm not suggesting that, like, you know, we cancel Shakespeare. Like, that's not where I'm, <laughs> not where I'm going with this at all. Um, but I think it's interesting. Let's put it this way. Shakespeare wrote a whole lot of plays. This is like one of the seven plays of his that is most often read and performed and studied in schools. I find that remarkable. And as you said, that as I've mentioned in the book, it is there has been this like, you know, gaslighting that has been that has gone on to sort of convince English speaking Jews that this is actually awesome. And the way in I express this in the book is it's actually kind of a, 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 a kooky thing that happened, which is that I ended up for for reasons that are not worth explaining uh, in this interview because it would take too long and it's ridiculous. But um, I wound up listening to a BBC like radio production with uh, of Merchant of Venice with my 10 year old son. Um, we had a long commute. Um, yeah, as I said, we ended up, he insisted on listening to this play. And what was amazing to me is that like, before sharing this with him, I was sort of like remembering the same thing as that, that you mentioned, um, Harvey, about your experience in, you know, in high school where like, you know, the teacher's like, oh, you know, it's not anti-Semitic. It's just a product of its time. It's so much better than Christopher Marlowe's, you know, the Jew of Malta, where the guy talks about how he's poisoning wells. I'm like, well, that's a low bar. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, and oh, look, you know, Shylock has this monologue where he's like, you know, half not a Jew, eyes, hands, organs, dimensions, you know, like this is like, you know, this like monologue, which, by the way, is like about a paragraph, which like every English speaking Jew is like expected to take as a compliment. And I shared this play with my son, who's 10 years old at the time. This is a couple years ago. Now he's 12. Um, who's 10 years old. And, you know, I had to keep hitting you know hitting stop and explaining you know the language and things like that it's just sickening how many things that it's like you know you're sitting there explaining to a 10 year old like what does this line mean certainly the jew is the devil is the devil incarnal 
You know, you're sitting there explaining to a 10 year old a line like the Hebrew will turn Christian. He grows kind. Um, Try explaining that to your 10 year old son. But then the amazing thing to me was, you know, that we got to this monologue that like, you know, makes it all okay, where, you know, and I like, you know, and I explain this to my son, I'm like, this monologue, it really changes the way you think of Shylock, it makes him more human. And I play this monologue for him. And my son is like, wait, that's the part that makes him more human. And I was like, yeah, he's talking about how he's like, you know, just a regular person with regular feelings. And then my son laughs at me. And he's like, Mom, this is the evil supervillain monologue that every evil supervillain does in every Marvel movie, right? Like, I've had a rough life, and if you were me, you'd do the same thing. So, you know, that's why I'm going to go, you know, kill the hero, ha, 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 right? And he even says, and I've, you know, at the end of this, that monologue, he talks about, like, how, oh, this is why I want revenge. Like, this is absurd. And, you know, what's shocking to me was, like, you know, I'm a person, I'm a, I'm a Harvard PhD in comparative literature, and I was gaslighted by this. Right. I mean, like, you know, I don't like, you know, it's like I'm aware that Shakespeare's work has many layers and many nuances. However many layers it has, this is one of them. And we're pretending that it's not there. That to me is amazing because, you know, I was in those high school English classes, too. I remember reading Othello, another very problematic play from our point of view now in a in racial and multi, you know, in multi ethnic society. We talked about those problems in Othello. Right. Like we talked in the English class about the role of race in Othello, et cetera. But then it's like in Merchant of Venice, it's like you said, like, oh, it's just a product of its time. It's really a critique of capitalism. It's like, is it? No, it isn't. Um, so, yeah. And as I said, I feel like Jews and it like, was upsetting to me was that like Jews have been asked to participate in their own humiliation. Right. You as the student in the class are expected to be like, oh yeah, it's just a product of its time. It's like, well, that's not the way we're talking about Othello, right? That's not the way we're talking about, you know, the taming of the shrew, right? Like, yeah, there's a lot of things in here that are a product of its time, but then why are we still reading it? And not just why are we still reading it, but why are we pretending that this isn't a problem? That's the piece. It's not, and my problem is not that we're still reading it because I'm not in favor of any kind of cancellation or, you know, that's, that's not the argument I'm making. I just want to know, like, why are we pretending that the problem isn't there? Yeah, exactly. I, I tell you, the more I listen to you, the more I want to go back and read the book again, because I'm just getting so much out of it and out of what you're saying. In your discussion of current anti-Semitism, your comments about the internet are very telling, Dara. You write, and I'm quoting, the internet allows anyone to say whatever they want. Comments sections have become an open sewer flowing with centuries old garbage. And with the explosion of social media, those comments have evolved into open vitriol as abstract hate has escalated to direct verbal attacks on Jewish institutions and individuals. So Dara, do you see a solution to the rampant bigotry and lack of accountability on social media? I mean, I think that's probably a, a much bigger problem that I, you know, it's, it goes way beyond the Jewish community, obviously, and it's something that's you know, probably far beyond my ability to, to address. Um, but I think clarity really helps. Um, one of the things I talk about in these also is not just like the way that, um, you know, the, the vitriol, because that to me was sort of what was so shocking in my adult life, right? I mean, I'm 44 years old. I don't feel like anti-Semitism was at all part of my life growing up. Um, but like, I now see that like my children are exposed to this all the time online. Um, you know, and my children aren't even like such, you know, internet users, but it's like, you know, you can't like, you know, you, you can't look at these platforms without seeing this. Um, so, you know, that's very shocking to me. Um, and I remember like when those common things first started being available, it was like a curtain went up, right? Like it was like, suddenly you could see what everybody was thinking. That was what was so shocking to me. But in terms of like, you know, what could help, I think clarity, Right. I think sort of not this, you know, the, the problem is that like in when the problem is when the art is, is not just the problem of this comments under the article and all the vitriol on social media. It's also the sort of idea that um, the, the lack of clarity about like when this is happening, like I said, the, and it starts like in high school when you're like, you know, Merchant of Venice, it's fine. You know, it's not a problem. But what you see is like, even in the sort of like articles written by educated people that have been fact-checked, et cetera, um, I talk at the end of the book about anti-Semitic attacks that were um, happening just before the pandemic against the Hasidic community, 
in the United States. And these were like, you know, somebody walking into a crowded Hanukkah party in a Hasidic uh, community, like with a four foot machete slashing people. What was amazing to me about that is like, you know, this is like really an unambiguous hate crime. Like there's really no nuance here, but you almost couldn't find a news article about this attack that didn't say something like, well, you know, there have been a lot of tensions between the Hasidic and non-Hasidic community in this town. You know, there was a zoning battle, there was a school board battle. And I was like, well, do we normally resolve municipal disputes with a machete? Because silly me, I left mine at home before the last school board meeting. Like, you know, there's this, when you, when the art, when the article itself is written that way, that is a signal to the public saying, you know, that actually these people deserve it. And that's where I think there's the, there, there, you see this sort of the social media piece seeping into the larger educated conversation and, and, you know, sort of like, you know, gate kept conversation or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that's where I think clarity is really important because what you see is this sort of like what I talked about is gaslighting, this sort of attempt to pretend that this isn't happening. Right. Um, and that's, you know, something that I think would help for everyone is to be able to see when this is happening and, you know, to, to recognize it and call it out and sort of just know that like, there's not like, well, if you're going to be a person who's anti-racist, if you're going to be a person who's anti-bigotry, there's not a carve out for Hasidim. Like, there's not a carve out for Israelis, you know, there's not like, if you, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's like, there's these pieces where people try to justify anti-Semitism by, you know, sort of, you know, giving these long excuses. And that's, that's not what's happening here. And I think that you see the sort of, you see that so glaringly, um, ben, but I think it's, it's important to express it because apparently a lot of people aren't seeing it. Yeah, for sure. Do you see a qualitative difference between being anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist? I mean, I wish I did, but I will tell you that there's a chapter in the book that is about um, the execution of a Soviet Yiddish actor in 1952 um, that's goes, you know, that goes back into the history of the Soviet Union. And in that chapter, in my research for that chapter, I discovered, I mean, it's not like my discovery, like this is very known to scholars, the origins of the sort of idea that, oh, we're not anti-Semitic, we're just anti-Zionist. It goes back to the Soviet Union in the 1920s. And where they were, the premise of was that the Bolshevik revolution, they were like, oh, we're not anti-Semitic, we're just anti-Zionist. And the way that was expressed was by persecuting, imprisoning, and torturing and murdering thousands of Jews. You know, and so I mean, that was, you know, when they were they were only anti-Zionist, right? So like if you were speaking Yiddish, it was fine. It was just if you were speaking Hebrew that they murdered you. Right. Well, within a generation then the Yiddish actors were also being murdered because, you know, they were part of a Zionist plot to destroy the Soviet state. Spoiler alert, there was no, there was no Zionist plot to destroy the Soviet state. This is part of the gaslighting. You know, are there conversations to be had about, you know, politics in Israel? Yes! Is that, is that what's happening when a teenager on TikTok posts Shabbat Shalom and then thousands of people post free Palestine, you fill in the blank curse words? That's not a conversation about Israeli policy. I think we can be clarity here. That's what I'm talking about. I think we can be clear about what's happening there and, you know, putting a little veneer over it of, of, you know, oh, this is just anti-Zionism or putting a little veneer over it of like, oh, you know, those religious fundamentalist Hasidim is like, I, I just don't think it's relevant because, you know, these are not, these aren't, if I'm, I have a lot of respect for conversations about Israel, but these aren't conversations about Israel. Right. Just like just like they weren't in the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and 50s. And actually until the Soviet Union collapsed and, and the Soviet Union, by the way, also sort of, you know, filtered out this slogan to all its client states in the developing world. Um, so there's you know, that's that's a whole other conversation. And I think you see that coming to light in like things like the Durban conference. What's been the reaction to your book within the Jewish community? So it has been. I, I've I've actually been kind of stunned because I am receiving sort of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages, you know, regularly, like almost every day I'm getting many, many messages from readers from and, and a lot of them from Jewish readers from every possible walk of life, like old people, young people, religious people, secular people, people who, you know, aren't Jewish, but, you know, maybe have some Jewish relative or something who are all saying, I have 
experienced this my whole life and I never had the words to express it or I felt uncomfortable my whole life in these situations and I didn't know that I was allowed to feel uncomfortable. I never understood what was going on until you explained it to me. And that has been, you know, it's funny because, you know, this is my sixth book. It's always great to have readers who tell you like, oh, your book meant so much to me. But with this book, I kind of wish it wasn't. I wish that fewer people thought this was resonant because what that really is, it's been shocking to me because basically it's telling me, you know, yeah, this really is a real problem and everybody is noticing it. Um, and yeah. I've also gotten, you know, quite a bit of mail from non-Jewish readers as well. So who are, you know, and, and also readers who sort of see like, I read your book and this is giving new ways of understanding the way we suppress Native American history, for example, um, you know, or sort of like, you know, this book has given me a new way of thinking about, you know, the you know conversation about African American history. So I mean, so like, you know, it means, you know, one thing I've learned about publishing books is you write one book and then everybody you're, you're, who's reading it is reading a different book than the book you wrote. Sometimes they're reading a better book than the book you wrote, which is very wonderful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've gotten a tremendous response um, and, you know, it, which, you know, like I said, it's nice to have people like who appreciate your book, but, you know, it's a little upsetting that people have appreciated this book as much as they have. Well, the way I would express it to you is that I think my vision and understanding of Jewish history before reading your book was in black and white, and now it's in color. That's the, that's, a, a, and, and when I was reading your book, I kept asking myself, what is the key message that Dara is trying to convey to her Jewish readers? Are you saying that we're too focused on the stories of Jewish destruction and Hanukkah and Passover and the Holocaust and visiting museums and graveyards and heritage sites? Are we not focusing enough on the world of living Jews? Well, I think that that's true really for, you know, for the, the that was really sort of my more my message for a broader audience. But I think that, you know, there are probably, but I think that sort of when I say a broader audience, I mean, there's kind of a spectrum here, right? It's not like there's Jewish readers and non-Jewish readers, right? There are readers who have like a profound investment in Jewish life and Jewish education. And there are readers who have no connection to that at all. And then there's like a wide range of people in between, right? Who, you know, maybe are themselves Jewish, but never really had any kind of Jewish education. Um, you know, so a person like that may have the similar response to a non-Jewish reader in that they, they're only, because like I said, most people have only learned about dead Jews, right? If you, if you happen to be Jewish, but you haven't, you know, really had any kind of education in this culture or tradition, then your education is the same as a non-Jewish reader who, you know, what they know about it is what they learned about the Holocaust, right? So, you know, because that's what they're exposed to. So what I do want to encourage is like, you know, people to, you know, of any background to sort of explore the content of Jewish civilization, you know, and that's something at the end of the book, I end up um, at the, the, the way the book ends is with me embarking on this study of the Talmud. Um, you know, in a, in a, in a deep way and sort of really, and what I discovered in that dis and study of the Talmud is how much of this tradition is like an exercise in what I would call post-traumatic growth, right? What psychologists call post-traumatic growth, because the Talmud is this like vast compendium of conversations that happen after the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of Jewish sovereignty in Israel. And so, I mean, that was really a place like in the ancient world, like when they like destroy your capital and they kill everybody and they exile everybody, like that's the end. Like you're not supposed to like keep being a people after that. Like that's like when you're done. And that's not what happens to the Jews. Instead, the Jews sort of have this ongoing conversation like, well, our, our homeland and our place of worship to God was destroyed. Now what? And that now what is like this open conversation. And that's to me what's like so amazing is about the resilience of this tradition and how much it relies on conversation, how much it relies on text, study, um, critical thinking. Um, that's a piece where when I talked before about like, what if we were to weave this counterculture of Jewish life into the history of the West? Um, you know, it undermines a lot of what you think, because, you know, in Western history, we think about literacy as being something like, oh, only the nobles and the clergy could knew, knew how to read until, you know, the printing press or something like the Jewish community had, you know, pretty much universal literacy since ancient times because it was important to the Jewish community. So my, I would encourage people, you know, readers, you know, Jewish and non-Jewish readers to sort of learn more about the content of this civilization. Because what's really remarkable about, about Jewish history is not that people kept trying to kill the Jews, but that Jews survived and thrived because they had something to live for. 
And so it's worth sort of exploring, like, what is that thing that the Jews are living for? And, you know, that, and I think that's something that can inspire people of, of any background. So Dara, how can readers find out more about your work? Well, you know, the book is available, as we say, wherever books are sold. I have a website, darahorn.com, where you can find out more about me and other public events that I do. But also, I want to direct your listeners toward my new podcast, which is called Adventures with Dead Jews. It tells different stories from the ones in the book. So if you've already read the book, you will get a lot of new, it's entirely new material, but it's with the same themes and exploring the same sort of problems that I explore in the book. And also, maybe it's a little bit funnier. Well, Dara, I must tell you, I found your book totally absorbing because it challenged everything I thought I believed and understood about how Jews are perceived by the general public and how we as Jews contribute to those perceptions. Thank you so much for writing this book and for taking the time to come on our show to discuss it. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure to have this conversation. I mean, it, it is, you know, maybe not a pleasure is not the right word for this context, but I'm glad to be able to have this important conversation with you. Thank you. I really am too. Our guest has been author Dara Horn. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.